Welcome to Re-Review, where we watch movies from our past with a perspective from today. Your hosts are Matt, Bobby, and Austin, and we love the films from our youth, so we're taking a look back to see if they still hold up. We are continuing our special February slash Valentine's movie month, where we are re-reviewing romantic films, so get out the tissues for those tears. The details, each of us has selected one love-related film to watch. That accounts for three films this month, so a randomizer will pick the fourth movie of love. The first episode covered My Big Fat Greek Wedding, and the second was Serendipity, so please go back and take a listen if you haven't heard those yet. For our third film, I, Austin, have chosen Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It was released in 2004, directed by Michel Gondry. It stars Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet, Tom Wilkinson, Elijah Wood, Mark Ruffalo, and Kirsten Dunst. This movie asks, what would you do if you had the opportunity opportunity to erase heartbreak from your memories? Now, this is a fair warning. We're spoiling a 19-year-old movie, so if you haven't seen it, we will be revealing key plot points. What a film, guys, huh? Huh? I know. I think the big question that we've had uh, going along here is, you know, what makes a a romantic film a romantic film? And more importantly, what are the things that draw you in in terms of having, you know, enjoying uh, a romantic type film and looking at what we've started with so far i think we have uh, sort of common themes we look at big my big fat greek wedding very familial family oriented kind of jovial happy joy even though it was the uh uh the ugly duckling you know trope and things coming out of that and then we move on to serendipity which definitely feels more of the cookie cutter romance i think movie we could say sort of almost like a hallmark movie in a way they they probably lifted all the hallmark movie uh template from that type of film for serendipity and then we get this one which seems to be about broken people just really really broken people broken people deserve love too <laughs> Do they? Do they? <laughs> Do, <laughs> Some of like, them. This made me question it. Like, <laughs> when, when you self-sabotage your own relationships, do you? And and that's kind of the thing we could kind of, you know, what makes this a little bit different is it it does seem that this is all about the the heartbreak part of it. What does it mean to have a healthy relationship? And more importantly, when you have an unhealthy relationship, what do you do to get yourself away from it? I think there are many points while we were watching this film, the discussion was kind of uh, a turn of, run away so we have our main characters joel barish played by jim carrey and clementine played by kate winslet and um it was very obvious early on that they have a very very poor unhealthy relationship and i think matt you clearly pointed out multiple (laughs) times turn around stop talking to this person this is not good for you why are you doing this to yourself yeah and the the thing that i thought was the funniest thing about this movie was and I, I get it was probably the intention of it was the fact that even with, you know, the erasure of memories and whatnot, like you, they would still end up in that cycle, right? Like mm-hmm. y- they literally could not escape how terrible it is. And that's not an unrealistic thing. People are in terrible relationships and stay in terrible relationships, even though they should leave for a multitude of reasons, but they still stay. And an outward person looking at it, always, you know, will scream at the screen, you know, saying, you know, why, why, why did you stay with that person? Why are you still with that person? Why all those things, whatever. And I guess from my perspective, it was hard to, you know, empathize with the characters because I don't, I like to believe I wouldn't be that person who would stay in that kind of relationship. And even more so, it felt like both of them were very aware that it was a toxic Mm -hmm. relationship for both of them. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I don't think it ever even hit the level of self-awareness where they were aware that they were toxic for each other, but it was better than the alternative type mentality that you see sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we're bad for each other, but the alternative of being alone is way worse. I don't think this movie ever got to that point. Maybe a little bit, maybe for Joel a little bit, like through, uh, through dialogue, he kind of hinted at like how, bad being like you know his 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 hatred of valentine's day right was trying to show like oh being single was terrible but like i they didn't really go in in depth in the idea that them being single was worse than being Mm -hmm. together so you are just screaming at you know this is literally the horror movie we're like don't go up those stairs you know 
the entire Which movie. I think you mentioned you. If we looked at it, there are plenty of scenes that you felt this could be recut or a trailer could be done in the in the vein of a horror film with the way they did the scenes and things like that. I mean, I think you're right in terms of we're looking at what are essentially a lot of ugly people in ugly situations choosing very ugly decisions as you go along. And that's really, you know, for me, the thing that I loved about this film back in the day was just seeing something that didn't fit that cookie cutter mold that we see from other films and getting the idea of watching broken people on screen that seem to mimic in a way, well, art imitating life, you know, not the idea of life imitating art because you get a lot of that. We, we get a movie that um, it, we could talk about sort of the progress that they take us through here because we start with really looking at the present and then it takes us through the past, but we, we open with, you know, scenes that they end up bringing us back to where Joel meets Clementine in Montauk and they're, you know, having awkward discussions with each other. You know, we're, we're introduced to him pointing out that he's like, Oh, there's two years of my, uh, my journal missing. That's really odd. Okay. And then they just kind of move on with it and they go through these steps to eventually she wants to bring him back to his house. And then we're introduced to Elijah Wood's character who meets Joel and just says, what are you doing here? And we don't really know the setup at this point. And then it flips over. Mm-hmm. We get the, uh, the stuff that I love, which is the John Brion score coming in with all that really cool music. And we have the Beck song that comes in. Um, everybody's got to learn sometime, but now we're taking into what led up to this point and we get introduced to these tumultuous characters who really have an unhealthy relationship that seemed like it could have been good at one point. And we get introduced to this, I guess, what would you call it? The sci-fi or the fantasy aspect of this, Mm -hmm. which is uh, there is a way in this universe for the things that you do not like, you can go to someone and have them take it out of your, your mind so that you can forget these things permanently and those things that you feel you were scarred by, you can no longer be scarred, scarred by. And we see a little bit of this when Joel, you know, first comes in or when he second time he comes in with his bag of stuff that he's trying to, to let go of, to forget Clementine. We have a woman who's sitting there with, uh, with all of her stuff from her dog. Because clearly her dog passed away and she doesn't want to hold on to those memories. And then the gentleman, I think he had a statue of some sort. Like maybe he was a. a it was like a trophy, woman. I think, or something. Yeah, a trophy. Yeah. And something he wanted to forget. So it it starts that whole path of, okay, we already know they're broken. We learned that Clementine does this to herself to forget Joel. And Joel's now taking the same path. But it always made me go, you know. Life is full of challenges, as we know, that is humanity at its core, and there's always going to be bad things that happen. Would you, in this position, if if this thing was available to you today, Bobby's laughing, so you get to answer this. (laughs) (laughs) Bobby's just going to be quiet from now on. He's like, no. I mean, take a look back. Would you, are there things, you don't have to say what they are, but would you take advantage of, 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 of service like this? Never mind the cost. We can get into what this should really cost so later. What I would be more interested in, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, not because I have any reason to, just because I go down the thinking rabbit hole from time to time, but I would be more interested in a time machine basically to go back to those moments and basically like change them and manipulate them as what at will, like oh, go back and like, you know, like change the things that would alter the timeline and make a variant of myself and not actually like erase memories. Cause in this case, you don't remember them, but they still exist. Like there's the, what is it? The neighbor guy in the building who's like, mm-hmm. Hey, David how's your, Cross. Oh how, no, you're right. The neighbor at the, the beginning. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So he's like, Hey, how's everything going with your, with your girlfriend? How's Clementine? And he's like, what are you talking about? And that's super awkward and weird. So I just prefer to just make it n- never have happened at all, as opposed to just make it never have happened in your own mind. 
That's a mighty powerful thing you're asking for there, <laughs> especially with the timelines. You're looking for like an eternal sunshine multiverse. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to erase everything, not like it never happened at all. Not just in my this own is mind. So much but... darker. <laughs> you like go into a different timeline to find yourself, and then so that way you make a change so that your current self disappears. And isn't that how timelines work? So you would yeah. vanish because yeah. you're undone. Something? Right. That's exactly what I want. Matt, are you as dark as Bob? <laughs> you just want to erase yourself. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean I don't exist anymore. I mean I like take over because I know what I know now, and then I erase. Oh, that's even better. You erase your old self. Yeah, I erase my old <laughs> self, and I take over my old my old point of view from that point on. Oh, someone write this screenplay. For yeah, me. I, feel, I, I feel like I we're writing like, a different movie now. <laughs> I just be like, run away, Bobby, run, run, run now. And then Bobby <laughs> runs away. And then and, and then, there's the key part, the, the running that people don't do. Broken people don't run, right? They stay in the brokenness. Matt, would you take advantage of the service? Probably not. Probably for a similar reason to what Bobby is talking about. Just playing you know, mental simulations of situations. I've always wondered if I would have, because we've all made, poor choices in the past, right? Mm -hmm. Whether they're small or big, whether they're, you know, seemingly, you know, non-consequential at the time and then they became so later on or whatever. You always play that game. If I would have done this differently, right? If I would have mm -hmm. said this differently, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, there's something we would have done differently as a kid in school. There would have been something we would have done differently as adults in relationships or jobs or, you know, whatever. Um, and I, I've gone through that same thing, just kind of, playing out of my head, but in every situation, I always play out like the fact that, and this is something that I think would have been interesting to explore a little bit more in this movie would have been the idea of if you remove that aspect of your life, how different do you become as a result? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's good and bad things that happen to you shape who you become over time. You either build up defenses and armor to shield yourself against those things or use them to bolster your personality and confidence and, you know, all these things that, you know, turn into you in the end. So I can't imagine removing an aspect of my life, especially it was like two years, right? They were together. Mm -hmm. Two years. Two, two years is, I mean, wild. you know, there, there's so much that happens and this is where the tech, the technical aspect of it would play into. And this is where my mind went when we we're talking about like, what well, the cost and the technology behind of, you know, something mm -hmm. like this would be, you know, does it, you know, if I, if I remove a memory of Clementine, when I'm at a party, do I just remember that party without her there? Or does the entire memory go away? Like what happens in my mind whenever she was there and something occurred, is there just an empty space in that memory now? And how does my mind justify that later on? Or, you know, is it the same kind of thing whenever you think to yourself like, oh, who was that person who said that thing? I can't remember who that was. Like, does it kind of right. turn into that in your mind? Yeah, um, that's a that's a good point. To answer your question, I don't think that I would. I think there'd be a temptation for it. Um, but I think that I would have to be in a very bad place in my life to want to erase something like that. I'd have to be at the point where it's like, it can't get any worse than this. This would be a, it would be a moneymaker if the service existed for sure. Can you do like a trial, like be like, okay, just erase this little spot and then see what happens. And then you're like, then, I love it. And then go back again. I, I honestly, and it's kind of a mixture of kind of what you were saying, Bobby, about the whole idea of time travel. I think that a much more interesting use of this isn't the erasal, erasure, eraser, erasure of, of memories, but rather the ability to, I think that this should be something that was kind of like inception. It should be used mm -hmm. as a tool for therapy instead mm -hmm. where you could actually go back and relive those memories to tr try to come to terms with them. Right. And I feel like that's kind of what happened for the most part towards that the end of this movie. Uncomfortable. Why being able to, <laughs> to relive to, my own terrible memories, but you're right. I mean, that's really what, what Joel Barish goes through mm -hmm. because I mean, I'll tell you one of my, my favorite scenes in the film has always been, um, when he's talking to Clementine and they're underneath the blanket 
And, you know, she's talking through how she felt as a kid, not feeling very pretty. And he's telling her she's very pretty. And they're having this moment where it's kind of sort of that pure, like she's being vulnerable and he's being there for her. And this memory is being wiped out. And I think this ties to what you're saying, Matt, in terms of how big is that erasure in the mind? And he just, he says like, please let me keep this memory just this one. Cause he's going through this going, wait a second. I don't want this. Maybe there are things I can learn from, from holding on to the badness. Now, of course, that's, that's the, uh, the catch here, right? We, we have a character who decides to go through this process and then there's a fight the entire time. And that leads us into, I think the other things that we see going on, but I, I want to talk and ask you how you felt about, you know, the way they approached this memory travel sort of, Matt, you mentioned maybe this could be a good therapy because you kind of get a third person view into your own memories. How did you like the way they presented it? Because one of my favorite things is when the lights went out in the Barnes and Noble and also when the books turned completely blank. Yeah, I really kind of represent those things going out. Did you like the way they kind of moved this through these memories? I think that they did a pretty interesting job of interpreting what the, the because it could have very easily have been you know something a lot more straightforward where literally you just saw like things just blipping out or you know things vanishing kind of like you know like you know Avengers Endgame where things were just being dusted in the memory or whatever yeah. mm-hmm. but instead you did see those kind of things where it was a little bit more um artistically rendered i guess the the approach to things disappearing um, like you said, like the, I think the thing that I noticed the most was the Barnes and Noble when all the books turned white. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was probably one of the more interesting things that they did. And obviously the, the horrific aspect of all the faceless people right. um, that kept popping up the nightmare fuel, right. the faceless people. Um, I think that it was an interesting approach to it. I, I think there's been a couple of movies that have also de- like dealt with memories that have used similar approaches and it, it's where I think this movie kind of as weird as the cinematography was at times with the very Blair witch esque mm-hmm. approach to some of the memories, mm-hmm. like literally it seemed like they just put a flashlight on top of the camera and was kind of moving it around. Um, I think that those kind of scenes kind of made it a little bit more cinematic in a sense, a little bit more interesting. Visually. Yeah, there, was, there was like a, it looked like almost like a photochemical, like emulsion burn where there was like a red glowing on the image. And I I really liked that scene where, or I thought it was a kind of a neat effect where they were in front of like a a group of stores and the crashed car was on one side and then they kind of look over at the other side and the crashed car would be on the other side and some car just like fell out of the sky, it seemed like, (laughs) and you know, all the signs were disappearing as it was going on. So I thought there was a lot of neat things and they all looked like they were in camera to me. They looked like they were like practical effects, which I liked. Yeah. The, the Jim, the two Jim carries, uh, when they were doing that flashlight scene, when he was in the doctor's office where he kept panning between the, Mm -hmm. the Jim carry and, that was exploring the memory and the Jim Carrey that was in, like was there during the memory. Like it kept panning back and forth and it was so fluid that my mind was trying to make sense of how they probably did that shot yeah. from a technical mm-hmm. point of view. Like right. well, it, clear, it clearly isn't Jim Carrey taking off his hat, running around, sitting down <laughs> and going back or whatever. But like, it was such a clean transition between that and cause it would have been one thing just to have the two of them going back and forth, but the, the doctor in the middle um, uh, uh, I can't remember what his name is. Uh, Tom Wilkinson's Mer- Mer- character, yeah. uh-huh. him being in the middle kind of made it so that it, you couldn't do the classic trick of, you know, the, you know, the split screen. Right. right. So there had to be something a little bit more complex to it. So I think there were shots that felt natural, like nothing in this felt super. And maybe it was the times it didn't feel super CG. Mm hmm. You know, it didn't feel like Inception, right? Where like you saw the world exploding and, right. you know, all this other stuff where like clearly they would have had to use, like it felt like they probably did as much of this in camera as possible. And anything that was CG blended really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good way to to talk about Dr. Merziak and and Mary Kirsten Dunst and, 
and Hulk Stan, Mark Ruffalo, <laughs> and good old Hobbits, Hobbits everywhere, Elijah Wood. Um, we have these other characters that get their own little tale that's going on as the people who are erasing Joel's memory. And they're all weird and messed up in and of themselves, right? They like to do drugs. They like to to steal panties from <laughs> the people they performed. <laughs> <laughs> this procedure on like that that whole group did you did you how did you feel about you know we know this is about joel and clementine how'd you feel about all this ancillary stuff especially the fact that they ended up having a very awkward older man younger woman relationship between mary and and dr merziak right on top of the relationship between <laughs> hulk and mary also you mean Yes. W- within minutes of that, essentially. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Bobby. Uh, you know, it's kind of weird because in a way, did, because whenever you do a movie like this, like d- does those characters and do their actions progress the story, you know, a- as just as a whole, right? That I remember asking myself is like, is this just a distraction from the main characters? Mm-hmm. But I kind of feel like, and I guess we're kind of jumping a little bit ahead towards the end. I think mm-hmm. that all that kind of had to happen in order to kind of set up the whole uh, revealing of the mind wiping mm-hmm. with, uh, with uh, what was it? Mary? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, Her basically reveal. I, yeah. I feel like maybe that was the whole point of it. And to also show that no one had good relationships in this movie or the universe or whatever. Like, no, I think I said, like, everyone seems to be broken and messed up in this movie. There's, like, no normal people. So, I I don't know if it was needed, but at the same time, I can see kind of why they did it. It felt kind of weird, to be honest. I mean, the Patrick part hurts more than anything, right? Stealing from Joel's, you know, journals and repeating, you know, the exact same words he would use while he was with Clementine. It... I feel like at least the setup with Mark Ruffalo and Kirsten Dunst and, and Tom Wilkinson. Okay. They created the love triangle, yada, yada, yada. And she needs to have her, uh, Mary needs to have herself broken as a reminder that she's been mind wiped multiple times, uh, because she's done this before to lead to that point of, okay, we really need to let this go and maybe let people make proper decisions for themselves. But yeah, the Patrick stuff, I mean, it only just, it was there to be creepy at best, right? Yeah, that was, I, you know, the weird thing about it, and I was kind of thinking while we were watching it and while it was kind of playing out is what was his end game? He's trying to become a person who she wanted to forget. <laughs> what was that? What was the point of that? <laughs> it was more like this, the story point of view, right? And And a lot of these, a lot of these movies when they're, when there's a a guy that's going after the girl, the other guy has to be the villain, right? I guess it's kind of like something about Mary, a little bit like that, with the the mm-hmm. private investigator who, like, kind of stuck and pretended to be Ben Stiller's character, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Leading into, I guess, that reveal of we have to let the people know that this pain, this thing that they wanted to get rid of. And there probably was a focus. I feel like maybe the lady who who got rid of her dog should she should probably still let her. She probably didn't send her the tape of her uh, <laughs> of her <laughs> saying all the things she loved about her dog. <laughs> but for everyone else who this was a, a oh, true relationship, the thing, pain all over again you, for her. You know, getting getting these cassette tapes out and and kind of the reveal of 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 this pain. We go through this process of. Jim hearing or Joel hearing Clementine's tape first in the car and then both going back and forth. Like I'm not messing with you and you got to be messing with me. And then eventually ending up back at Joel's place with Joel playing the tape and it just keeps running. And for me, that is one of the biggest cringe points because you're listening to that tape and he is just saying the worst things. He's saying the absolute worst things. And they're just sitting there kind of, Hey, do you want a cocktail? (laughs) Do you want some whiskey? (laughs) It just listening to Joel's tape always makes me want to vomit. I do think that it it's possible that all that leads to 
them actually thinking, okay, let's actually make this work instead of let's just do the same things that we've been doing over and over and over again, right? Like, let's, when they say, okay, they, to me, it's like, and I like that scene a lot. It makes me think, okay is okay i want to make this work not okay i want to just have a terrible relationship i'm interested because that was going to be my final question to to and you bobby you've answered it and matt i want to hear how did you interpret that okay at the end you know they they went through this process of hearing how miserable they were with each other and joel just asked her to wait and then they're in the hallway and it's just kind of a I guess here we are. Okay. Well, to me, it seems like it seems like she doesn't want to wait. Sorry, Matt, I'm stepping in on your question, but she, you, you know, she. So I think that kind of like pushes her forward a little bit. Like, you know, every, everything from her character previously says like she's not the type of person to just sit there and quietly just wait for somebody else to figure their stuff out. You know, she's got to fill mm-hmm. in all those silent spaces. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was a push forward for her to just sit there and wait for him. Mm. Yeah, her impulsiveness is they keep reminding us of multiple times throughout the film. Matt, are you good with the okay? I think that the way that I kind of saw it and the way that made sense to me, I guess, is listening to those tapes did the thing that both of them needed in their relationship before the mind wipe, which was being honest mm. with each other. Mm -hmm. neither of them were truly honest with each other, even in their arguments. They never really said the things that really bothered them the most. Whereas listening to those tapes, they were actually being honest and it gave them the opportunity to face the things that they dislike about the other person or bothered them about the other person in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of gave them, okay, well we know where this can go and they had the choice of we don't want to end up like this again, or can we learn from it and try to grow from there? And I think that that's probably a more valid point in the concept of relationship. Cause I feel like this is one thing that you kind of find in long-term relationships is there's things that you, you discover as you go, whether they're small or big things. And you have to kind of accept those things or you, you know, you, you see them for what they are and you decide if it's a thing or not a thing for you. And Mm -hmm. clearly all these things, even to like the color of her hair, it bothered him, but he Mm -hmm. never said those things. Mm -hmm. And now they're all out in the open. They kind of got, they kind of got the benefit of starting a relationship from their point of view, knowing all the negative outcomes from the get go. And so that gives them the chance to potentially move past that. And I think that's kind of going back to what Bobby said before about, you know, changing the, you know, going to the past to change the future. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow and you heard a recording of what could be and you could either avoid it or you could try to make it better. Right. And -hmm. they just decided that at that point it made more sense to try to make it better. I would assume that's kind of, it left it in a vague enough place that it could very well end up that an hour later, they're in an argument again and it could have just been an endless cycle. You know, a a very inception-esque moment would have been if this is actually the 50th time they've gone through the mind wipe and they just weren't aware of it. I could totally picture either way, quite quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it was one of those where, you know, there's a little bit to me a sense of relief in that okay cuz it's just like okay we're we're just sitting here knowing that we're both just terribly broken people and the outcome could be exactly that. Ideally they learn from the things that they explored on those tapes and being honest with themselves but they could 100% be right back in that moment. Now before we get to our randomizer for picking our fourth film uh, I think we'll we'll do our roundabout to see, you know, how do we feel about Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind today? Are you recommending this for others to watch, Bobby? I think it's a good movie to watch. I mean, if you're in the, in the mood for 
messed up people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some parts of it are a little bit tough to watch. You know, it's a little bit real, but I mean, it's it's very artfully done. You know, but is in a in a strange undertone way. So I think it's worth a look in my mind. Matt, I would probably <laughs> what is that what is that, what is that judgment sound i just heard i would probably say it's you know this might shock you i'd probably say that i think it is potentially worth watching at least once shocked. um i yes, think that so i don't think that you should watch this movie expecting a romantic movie i think that you should if you should approach it for what it is which is a cynical take on people and romance mm-hmm. um I think that there's value in watching it even with like a significant other just if for nothing else to get the thought process going of a conversation about how you view relationships. And, you know, I do think that there was a lot of cringe in this movie. Don't get me wrong. There was a lot of cringe, (laughs) but maybe that was needed for the story to be told the way that it was told. I would say, Mm -hmm. check it out. Yeah, I, I mean, this still remains one of my favorite films, and I, and I really did enjoy enjoy this watch of it. But it is one, I think the caveat, the asterisk has to be there. This isn't about, you know, a feel-good love story. Go go watch Serendipity or My Big Fat Greek Wedding uh, if you want to get those good feels. This is, uh, maybe it gets you a little introspective, looking on the inside, what's important to you when it comes to a relationship. And ideally, you land on everything that Matt described earlier uh, in terms of what can make it successful with your significant other. So I think it's time for the randomizer, folks. Uh, I'm recommending to watch it if I didn't say it, but I think it's time for a randomizer. Matt, give us a breakdown of what we're going to get for our our fourth movie here. So let me go through my list really quick. Insert drum roll. (laughs) So uh, we... With this list, we've each chose 10 movies. Um, they follow the same sort of rules that we kind of go to for most of our movies, which they need to be at least 10 years uh, older. The primary focus had to be that it was a romantic movie at its at its core. It couldn't be, you know, like Die Hard where it's a Christmas movie, but it's really a movie about everything else. And it's just Christmas <laughs> in the background. Wait, Ro- Die Hard is a romantic movie, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> you could you probably make that movie into every kind of movie. <laughs> um, so romance has to kind of be the driving force or at least a, a very significant core of the movie. So we each chose 10. So a total of 30 to go through this. And I'm just going to run through the list really quick. Uh, we have coming to America, the proposal fools rush in blast from the past made in Manhattan, Titanic, 40 year old virgin, Wally, the wedding singer, you've got mail, Casablanca, twilight, a walk to remember, say anything, Notting Hill, 16 Candles, Down With Love, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, Best Friend's Wedding, Sliding Doors, The Notebook, Dirty Dancing, Romeo and plus Juliet, (laughs) Crazy Stupid Love, Sleepless in Seattle, Ghost, 10 Things I Hate About You, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Wedding Crashers, and Can Hardly Wait. I also added in three respins, just add a little bit of drama to the spin. Oh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to say this. There are things we all admit we don't want to watch here. Yes. Right. Yes. There, there, there there's, are a there's couple on this list. That could happen. There, there is at least one on my list that I didn't want. And there's a couple from your, you guys' list that I'm like, oh no. And I think yeah, some, some there, of these kind of like okay. might, might push our, our qualifications just a little bit too. I think that, I think the core is there, but yeah, there's a couple of them that might be a little bit on the edge. So is it time to see what happens? Yep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this list on the randomizer. I'm going to shuffle it five times. One, two, three, four, five. And we're going to let it go. You guys ready? Here we go, folks. Ready. It's spinning time. Let's go. Oh wow. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> All right, do you see you hear that reaction everyone? <clears throat> we're going to we're going back in time a little bit, much further than I think any of us expected. <laughs> Casablanca is the winner. Which was Bobby's pick. That was from his list. 
Yeah, from 1832. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be very interesting. I don't think it's one we want to veto, but I definitely very surprised. This, this is the, the list, so this is happen. the oldest movie we've seen, right? This will probably yeah. be the oldest movie we re reviewed. Wow. Okay. Uh huh. Play it I again, expect Sam. A, I, I expect a little bit of pain. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Matt, for running the randomizer. Next week's episode will be Casablanca to finish off Valentine's Movie Month. As always, thank you for listening. And remember, constantly talking isn't necessarily communicating. <laughs>